Good morning, or afternoon, March 14th, 2023. Okay, so yesterday we worked on this palm frond here, the very top palm frond. And, you know, I don't know if you guys can see it because it's so dark. But uh, the one thing that I see, especially in these dark areas, like right behind the palm frond, is it's just, it looks like chalk right there. Not white chalk, but it's, it's so dull, I can't tell the color or anything. It just, when it dried, and I, I'm not sure which paint that is, you know, maybe a mixture, maybe it's a sap green, maybe it's that corbet green. But there's no way I can tell those values. I know it's a dark value. I know because when I put it on there, it was. Oh, the music has a funky beat today. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, I got this, uh, this like kind of playlist called Stream Beats that it's completely royalty free. Just a whole bunch of songs for streams and I just put it on shuffle. Usually the light ones, there's a lot of, you know, hardcore and all kinds of other stuff in there that I don't do, but yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, one thing that is, that is difficult with oil painting is dealing with when the, when the paint actually, um, dries. Let me see if I can turn my canvas. Maybe you can see it a bit better. I have to wait for the stream to update. Yeah, you can kind of see it right, right in there where, you know, it's pretty dark down here in this area, but up in here, you can't really tell the difference between the palm frond leaves and the background. That's because it's dry and gray. It's like this kind of chalky thing that's happening. And that's part of uh, what happens with oil painting. Don't worry about it right now because once we go over it with another layer, or before we go over it with a glazing layer, I'm gonna do some oiling out on it, which will bring those colors back tremendously. The other thing I did was yesterday I caught up on my posts on my website. So check that out, uh, chrisbevan.com. Go to my daily art post and you can see uh, the high res photos of the progress of this painting as it's happening. Uh, that's going to be good for you, Thinker. And I bet you'll see exactly what I see. The latest post there's this big, super bright green <laughs> palm frond right here. The intensity is just out of this world. It's, it's way too intense. Uh, the color is way too intense. It needs to be more uh, desaturated and maybe a, a bit lighter. So we'll see. Um, but it's good. Uh, the, the, that's going to be one thing that I do a small video on is how important it is that after every painting session, you take photos and it doesn't have to be photos from a, you know, a DSLR camera. It could be from your cell phone and then you put them up, you know, on a website somewhere. It's a great way to share your work, put them up on a website, put them up on Instagram. That way you can look at them and you can see things like this. So it's not just about you getting your work out there. It's also about you kind of getting away from it 
uh, and being able to, on a smaller scale, see these problems right as they happen and uh, fix them pretty quickly. So there's a, a very positive reason for taking daily photos of your work. It's gonna help you out tremendously, definitely. All right, the first thing I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna try and keep my hand, the way my camera is positioned, my hand's like in the way of the, mixing the color on the palette. Let's see if I can fix that. On the stream, I'm gonna be adjusting cameras which is always going to be dangerous there now let's see what it looks like yeah that's better a little bit more of a top-down shot Maybe that got rid of some of the glare as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is mix up uh, my darkest color here. And I'm also going to add some sap green to it. So it's more of a green hue. That's my darkest color. Then I'm going to drag it out this way a little bit. So the paint gets really thin over here. And then I'm going to, I want to lighten it up. But as we look at the image of the uh, digital tiger, um, I want to keep it kind of cool and, and very desaturated. So I'm going to lighten it up with white. So just a little tiny bit of white I'm going to add in here. And we go right to gray. So that's good. I did a good mixture there. A nice gray mixture. Mm, sap green could be part of my dark mixture more often if I want something closer to gray all the time. Yeah, definitely. That's nice. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is pick up my other brush. This is going to be my lighter brush, and I'm going to mix up a lighter color. I'm still going to start with sap green. But I'm going to make or not sap green. I'm still going to start with my cadmium green because I want to get rid of this paint but what I'm really going to do now is try and desaturate it as much as possible and darken it up so I'm going to add in an orange burnt umber is an orange it's a very desaturated orange Oof! wow I went straight to brown it's a lot of burnt umber in there so that's a that's as desaturated as you can get I'm sure it's actually not a bad it's a kind of um, kind of muddy yellow ochre green color and let's add some corbet green into this what I'm, what I'm trying to do is get a starting mixture that we can begin with. And uh, it starts out as desaturated as possible. Close, a, a green closer to gray. Uh, what happened to my, my color wheel? I moved my color wheel. Oh no, I need to go get it. I use that thing all the time. Always have your color wheels somewhere where you can see it while you're painting. At least when you're in your studio. Yay, color wheel. So it's going to be down here. So if I have, you know, where's, where's my, so here's my cadmium green here super bright then sap green is the exact same green you see it's on the same line so it's it's the same hue it's just uh closer to gray and darker so it's and then any kind of purple i add to this like i can get out a cobalt violet if i want to uh 
and gray out a, a sap green or you know neutralize it or any blue would probably do it the lizard permanent would probably do it okay let's see now this is just um corbet green which i don't have on there because it's I just had a little sample tube from Williamsburg, um, but I really like that green. I don't, I don't think it's, it's not so difficult a green that you can't mix up yourself though, honestly. I'm going to put some of this down on my canvas, maybe a, a large area of it. I'm going to sit back and really look at it this time. Is that too intense? Now, we were talking about this before. You know, intensity is not... Um, you, can, you can get the in most intense paint on the market, right? Anything uh, 16 on the Munz Munzel scale right on the outside ring of the Munsell scale, right? You can get those anywhere. But the in important thing is, is it's relative intensity. You could have, you know, a very neutral color, but every other color around it is even more neutral. And that would be, you know, maybe too intense, you know, or something. So. Uh, it's all, all about what's around it. And this seems too intense because everything around it is even more dark and neutral. So I want to bring the intensity down again. Uh, thinker, you say, I couldn't think of his name yesterday, but one of the painters I really like is John Singer Sargent. I just couldn't think of his name. Oh yeah, Sargent. I didn't mention Sargent. I do have some of his books. <laughs> And I'll tell you why I didn't mention Sargent is because um, a bit of teenager in me is still like, oh man, everybody loves Sargent. I'm not going to say Sargent. But everybody loves Van Gogh, and I say Van Gogh. So, yeah, Sargent is freaking amazing. He is amazing. So I mixed up a little bit of purple, which is alizarin permanent and ultramarine blue, which is a very intense color. And I'm going to throw this into our green mixture. Just a little bit of it. A little bit more. A little bit more. It's gotten darker, which is good because I want to make this a little bit more cool as well. So I'm going to add some white. Maybe I'll touch, just barely touch the cerulean blue. Yeah, that's that's how you do it. You have to just put like two bristles of your brush in cerulean blue to get the right amount. If you get any more than that, like your whole palette changes to cerulean blue. The tinting strength of cerulean blue is just ridiculous. Okay, I want it to be more blue, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring some ultramarine blue directly into this mixture. More white to lighten it up. That's when you have to, one thing that you always have to think about is when you're mixing colors and you and you say something like, oh, I want to make this more blue, so I add ultramarine blue. You have to realize unless your color that you're mixing into is as dark as ultramarine blue, um, that it will actually darken up the color that you're mixing. So adding ultramarine blue would cause you to need to add a lighter color as well. That could be white, that could be a yellow. But always keep in mind, you know, the kind of hierarchy of color. You want to have your values on first, or your values accurate or correct, whatever that is, first and then anything else afterwards which is just two things saturation and hue
Now I'm not going to worry about adjusting the top palm frond. And the reason why, and I, I may even lighten this up a lot more than what I just put down. The reason why is because um, a lot of glazing layers work well if the layer beneath is lighter. You know, if you're going for something that's intense in some way, the glazing layers, uh, it'll be easier to glaze over them and get uh, a better result. Glazing always works better on a lighter color because you want to glaze with as pure a paint out of the tube as possible, as you can get. And try not and try to stay away from white as much as possible. So anytime that you can glaze and you can darken up a color with a glaze and not lighten up a color, it, it tends to work better. I believe most of Yeah, that's still not dry, but a lot of those dark colors from the palm prawn yesterday are already just about dry. I have friends that do, um, well, one friend that does acrylic painting. And we always go back and forth about the drying time. And I'm like, it's not that bad. <laughs> but, but he likes to, um, he likes to be able to paint very quickly. Like, put on multiple layers within an hour. <laughs> You're like, no, 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 work on the one layer, then come back tomorrow, or two days, and put on the next layer. It's nice and calm for me. He's a furious painter. So one thing I want to talk about this morning is on my YouTube channel, my, uh, they call them VODs or videos on demand. So the, the basic videos, not the live streams that get turned into the videos. I have several videos all about, uh, non-toxic oil painting. I, I saw a need within uh, the community that I serve is on YouTube, at least, you know, the very small niche, very, very small niche of individuals looking, you know, that were scared to oil paint because of the toxicity levels. So, um, I give alternatives to how to get into oil painting without using solvents. And one of the, the first things that you think about when you're making videos this way, and I, you know, I, I've, I did research on this, lots of research. And part of the research was looking at other videos, uh, that people have made that talk about solvents and how they can affect your health, uh, within oil painting. And the first thing that you think about when you're going to make a video and you're going to tell someone that, you know, you're commenting about healthy practices. It's more, I felt that it's more important to communicate the dangers a bit further, a bit more vehemently than to not communicate those dangers enough. Basically what I'm trying to say is when I communicated about, you know, the toxicity of solvents, you make it seem a little bit worse than it is because I would, I would rather people err on the side of caution than not, if that makes sense. 
I didn't want to tell people, yeah, it's kind of bad, but it's not, not too bad. Uh, and then someone have a severe issue with solvents and then, you know, come back to me and say, hey, I listened to you. You said it wasn't so bad. I tried it and it was really bad. And now I have health concerns. That's what I don't want, didn't want to happen. And so I communicated as um, strongly as I could. So what had happened is this morning I spent some time answering a comment from an individual that was so afraid of solvents after my, you know, watching my video and maybe watching other videos. Uh, that this person had um, already bought solvents from suggestions on the internet and they had solvent, you know, the can, the canister of solvents that was unopened in their home and they were having nightmares at night about the solvents combusting, like just bursting into flame and burning down their house or causing real issues just sitting there. And, uh, you know, I, I feel kind of, I feel bad about that because I, I, you know, I wanted to communicate the dangers of solvents, but I think where I missed the mark is giving this understanding that solvents have a long-term danger for most people. There are some individuals though, that are extremely sensitive to smells of any kind, to any kind of toxins in the air. And they know who they are, hopefully, and they need to watch out for it. So for those individuals, it would be different. But for, you know, healthy individuals, well, somewhat healthy individuals like myself, um, I see it as a long-term danger. Just like eating fast food every day. Um, you're going to see health concerns or health issues from that over the long term. If you go out and eat, you know, a hamburger at a fast food joint, the next day you're not going to gain 20 pounds uh, or, you know, have a cardiac arrest because of high cholesterol or, you know, high blood pressure because of too much sodium or, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time, just like solvents. And so I removed all of the solvents from my painting materials and I'm in the process of still removing the heavy metals, the cadmiums and the cobalts from all my painting materials. But if I needed to get out a solvent for any reason right now, I would do that. It would be Gamsol by Gamblin. And I would use it probably in my garage for whatever I needed to use it for and or outside in a very ventilated area. And I wouldn't think anything of it, you know, I, I would use it very, very minimally, not very often and be okay with it because in that kind of setting, it's not a problem. Now the, the other side of the coin, is when I was younger in painting, I would have a, a canister of solvents in front of me, open, and I would dip my brush into it every color change. Um, now that's the other side of it, and I know there's a lot of people out there that still do that. They keep their solvents open and they keep painting, using them while they're painting, and that's just you know, not good. You're not going to die from it within five minutes or hours or days or years. It's going to take a while, but eventually you're going to have a lot of health issues because of that. So the point of me, me talking about this right now is if you're afraid of solvents to the point of having nightmares, please uh, try and relax because it's a long-term health issue.
They don't spontaneously combust. The solvents in a can, is, in a, you know, in a can by themselves, a closed metal can, do not spontaneously combust. Although, I will say this: uh, there are many reports of like oily rags that are in a contained area with no way to breathe. Uh, those have combusted quite often, so be careful of that. I use paper towels for all my oil paints and they go into a bucket, actually in this room, uh, that is covered, but it has uh, a space. The bucket's covered, but it also has a space to breathe. So that some air can get in there and it can dry out any oil paint left in my you can see here, there's like little daubs of oil paint left in these um, paper towels. But you want it to dry, so you gotta get some air to it. You don't seal it up too much. And I, I, I will say that I don't let a lot of um, paper towels pile up in there before I take out the garbage. Hopefully that, that was helpful. I'm not sure how many people listen to it, but it could it could reach ears in the future, so that's good. I think the one thing that I fear, and, and you know, and I, I've gotten a couple comments like this where um and, and in my past uh, I've gotten, you know, kind of like the macho dude right that says things like oh solvents aren't a problem they put hair on your chest you know that kind of bullshit i'm sorry i gotta say it where it really that just really irks me there's kind of you know no understanding of the reality for most people But enough about that. Let's go back to the painting. Um, so I remember when we were doing digitally this palm frond here, that it's it's fairly flat, and it has kind of a flat side and then a, a quick turn to it down for all the the leaves. Um, I'm really kind of just getting the drawing of it reestablished right now, trying to get the values to where they're at. Or where they need to be and this you know these kind of leaves and things they're not easy to paint i remember even in the digital version uh, i was having a lot of trouble getting these to look um, authentic enough and even the bottom one, I'm, af I'm af actually afraid of the bottom palm frond because I remember we did a photo bash on it. And, um, which is a good way for, for me to be, for me to have basically avoided the, the problem of figuring out how to get a palm, palm frond to look authentic. So for sake of speed, I, uh, photo bashed it. Well, guess what? There's no photo bashing here, so I'm going to have to figure these palm fronds out. And it's going to take the time that it's going to need for that to happen. <laughs> and, you know, the other stream I was talking about the benefits of going back and forth. And I was struggling with finding the benefits to, you know, why you would want to, if you're a digital artist, to do traditional painting. And I just figured out one benefit for that. Um, there's a lot of shortcuts within digital painting that you can take. 
that will hamper your uh, abilities as an artist, drawing abilities, uh, you know, getting the understanding of form through perspective. So there's all kinds of things that you can do to kind of, um, you know, oh, I don't need to worry about this. I'll just photo bash or I'll use, you know, the, the uh, different tools and techniques for perspective that even Krita uses that are really awesome to get a, you know, to just to get a, a square on the page or a cube on the page or something in perfect perspective. And those are great. You know, like when you're in a production environment, like you're working on a movie or something, you need to get a movie out real quick. Um, you know, your boss or your uh, art director is waiting for something to happen. You know, this needs to be done yesterday kind of thing. Heck yeah, I'll use those tools. But if, if you're a beginning artist, if you're an artist that wants to get there at one point and you know that your work isn't there yet, adding in, you know, a traditional element will get you to um, face the issues that you have and not lean on all these uh, digital tools too much. You face the, those technical problems that your art has and it's, it's the way for you to grow, you know? You gotta put the time and the effort into what is hard for you. Okay, this drawing is, is looking kind of terrible, I will say. That's one thing is, I'm never gonna lie to you on this stream. <laughs> Literally, I'm not gonna lie to you about anything, really. I, I'm not gonna tell you that this is looking fantastic right now because it's not. Well, but that's also an opinion. So you could think it's looking fantastic, but... I don't think that the palm frond right now, the drawing of it's looking that, that good. Uh, and it's just something that is going to take time to work out. Some observation. A lot of times when you're painting, when you're doing anything, Life Lessons with Chris Bevan on the traditional and digital live stream. <laughs> so a lot of times when you're painting or are you doing anything in life, you're, you're like, you know, this just isn't working. Okay. And you get flustered and frustrated, but you keep going like kind of headstrong, just barreling right down the road. Like I need to get, I want to get this painting done. This isn't working, but I'm still just slapping paint on the canvas. Um, with for with no thought about it. The best thing you can do <clears throat> is to stop, calm down, put the brush down, and just observe. And I'm going to be doing that in a moment. As soon as I put down a couple more things, so I have more to observe. And then I'm going to talk out what, what problems I see with this. And then try and uh, find a solution as well. It's like I've said, you know, multiple times before. When you're in this space, in your painting or in life, where things are just not going well at all, this is the place where you have the most growth potential. Something a lot of people don't want to hear because they're frustrated, they're upset, they're like, this sucks and I hate it. But this is where you begin to 
to where you're outside your comfort zone. Where you have the ability to build the most skill, the ability to learn the most. Everything's telling you that, hey, this is what you need to work on. So try and see it as a good thing, if you can. But you have to take the time to step back and, sit and ask the question, why? Why is this not working? What are some things that I can possibly do to make it better? And one of the things I, I know I can do right now to make this better is fill in some of the, the dark areas that is not the palm frond at the moment. Get rid of that gray of the canvas for now. And I'm not worried about the drawing too much. I'm just kind of filling in. We'll get to that in a moment. But I am trying to get, you know, these values back here close to what's already back there. So it's going to be a bit lighter out on this side. And it's always good to paint a little bit of the foreground into the background and the background into the foreground. going to grab my tea. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to step back from this painting and I'm going to try and get an understanding of how I can improve it. Specifically the palm frog. Well, the, the first thing that I see The first thing I see with this palm frond, and a thinker, let me know if you can see it well enough, or if I need to zoom in or something like that, because I, I think I could. But the first thing, the first problem I see with it is the the leaves that hang down are too separated in my painting, and the overall shape. Because the palm frond has an overall shape, it's kind of like a blade, like it has a very flat top and then that turn on the side. I don't have that laid out well. So the overall form and how it turns, I could definitely darken up the shadow that's on it at the very far right and in the center. So three things there, get, get the major form of the palm front in first. That's what I'm going to do next. Um, and I'm going to do that by darkening up areas. And I might as well darken up some of those shadow areas as well. And then after that, I'm going to probably lengthen some of the leaves that are hanging down and group them, to them together a bit more. Yeah, those three things. That's what I'm going to try. Okay. So let's make up some more piles of paint. I'm going to start in this dark color. 
I can see the frond fine. Uh, highlights are lighter on the digital side. Okay. Good. Glad you can see it fine. I mean, that's important. I want you to be able to see it well. I want everybody to be able to see it well. Also kind of want to see the tiger as well because it's a great comparative between the two. <laughs> Alright, I got a dark color here. It's, um, I want to, I want to neutralize it a bit as well. So I'm going to add a little bit of alizarin permanent and a little bit of ultramarine blue. It's going to get a little bit darker, which is fine because I want to get some darker colors in there. And now that turn, that major shape of the frond, I'm actually going to just kind of draw it out because it kind of breaks here, like the, the form, there's the corner basically. It's kind of like Steve Houston in his book, uh, Figure Drawing for Artists. Gestures and structure, and he always talks about the corners of things and how they move. So the corner for this really is all down that way. So flat up top, a little bit lighter, and then everything below this line needs to get darker. But not too dark. And then while I'm doing these, like darkening up these fronds, I'm going to try and bunch them together a bit more. Bunch the leaves together. If you're having trouble with something as well, the first thing, I mean, at, well, after kind of calming down, de deliberating on possible fixes, the next thing you want to do is try and calm down enough so that you, you know, you can take your time. Don't rush it. If it's difficult for you, the, the, ne the one thing that you don't want to add into that is speed as well. It's like playing an instrument. If you've ever played an instrument before, when you're first learning uh, any chords or anything, any song, you play it slow first, like really slow. And you get your fingers and your mind or whatever you're playing wrapped around the, the structure of the music. And then you speed up a little bit. It gets harder. And then you get that down, you know, after you sped up a little bit faster. And then you speed up more. And you get that down. And keep doing that until you've... You've reached the, you know, the, the tempo for the song. Well, this is what we're doing. So if you're, if you're really struggling with accuracy in drawing, slow down, take your time, really observe, talk it out as you do it.
actually darkening up the background a little bit more back here as well. I'm switching between a lighter brush and a darker brush. I'm also in any sharp edges that I see here. I'm trying to soften as much as I can. At this point in the painting, I still don't want to have sharp edges, especially when we're getting further and further away from our center of interest, which is uh, the tiger's head. Sharp edges will attract attention and that's what we don't want. We don't want the rest of the painting to detract away from where we want um, our viewers to really look. Uh, I really like in Richard Smith's book, Alla Prima, it's one of the only books that well, that I know of that, you know, spends a, a significant amount of time on edges. I remember when I first read his book, it was uh, a revelation to me. And I'm like, wow, edges are so important. They, they, they have a range to them just like value or saturation. Really good book. So if you're an oil painter and you have not read Alla Prima by Richard Schmidt. I think I even have the the second edition. It's everything I know about a painting and more, which is nice. I still have the first edition, but I didn't buy it. I, it, it was back in you know, really early 2000s, I would say, maybe late 90s. Um, before the internet was really huge, before Amazon, and uh, I got it at the book at the not the bookstore. I got it at the library, but you couldn't take it out of the library, so I had to read it there. It was at my school's library. And I spent all kinds of money. Not as much as the book cost, because at that point it was, I think, uh, it was still like a hundred or something dollars to purchase the book. And I, I sat there and I copied each and every page of that book. Black and white. <laughs> on a copy machine. That way I could write on everything, make notes. It was fantastic. And I still have those photocopies. I'm, I'm sure the family of the late Richard Schmidt um, would not appreciate that, but I ended up buying the second edition later on in life and all the accoutrements that go with it. Yeah, right away, that's looking a lot better. Just slow, slowly, uh, just slowing down. Talking out what the problems are, getting a better understanding of 
what's not working and then making a plan to move forward. So helpful. I really love painting, honestly. I have a... I have a daily protocol, and there's things on it, you know, like exercise. You know, once in the morning, once in the evening. And the other things are like, I add meditation in as well. But I, I don't get to my meditation very often. Not because I don't have time, it's because I, you know, spend it doing other things. But there are days, like today, like right now, when painting feels like meditation. It's not. I know in the brain that it's not. Um, because my brain is working. It's working hard. It's not meditation, but it is very calming. I've, I've read too many books on healthy practices such as meditation and, um, I would like to say that things like um, painting and praying um, are meditation, but that they are they're calming, yes, but they are different than meditation. Meditation is uh, a training of the brain to focus on a particular point and nothing else. It's the antithesis to zombie scrolling on any social media platform. And something I think everybody could benefit from. And yet, I don't do it very often. I need to get back to it. Okay, so that's looking better. I'm darkening up this shadow that... Um, I remember when we put when I put that into the digital part, uh, the, the digital image, putting this kind of cast shadow, it really gave a lot of distance. I also need to bring the top palm frond down again over this one. Um, because I've been working on this palm frond so much and I'm kind of, you know, I, whenever you spend a lot of time trying to fix things, you'll end up build up building up um, a lot of paint. Which is not a problem unless you need to paint over it like this palm frond over this, you know, with a different value or a different hue. Then you have to uh, you have to work at that. I want to bring this break further up into the leaf. And I like how this one goes way back.
might change that. Not sure if I like the shape of it. Yeah, I don't like the shape of that. I don't like it. Actually, what I what I need to do as well is bring in some of these warmer colors back here. So I'm, I'm increasing the complexity a little bit here because I do see that this leaf is very warm, even warmer than that. Those variations are really nice. the same as what I see in our digital image as well. There's a bit of freedom that can happen here. If, if you feel like it needs to change in some way, then change it. It's it's your painting, it's, you know. Even if uh, if if it's not your image that you're working from, like a photograph that someone else took, you can make it your own. <clears throat> if you make some kind of mistake uh, or do something different accidentally, but it still looks good, you know, keep it. Begin moving away from uh, copying directly from images. I think copying from images is really great for anybody starting out. Because just using paint to get uh, it to look like what you're seeing is not easy. Um, and learning to do that first, I think, is great practice. It's how I've worked for years and years. Only recently am I really breaking away from that. And give it the time it needs. I'm gonna go back down here because I do really enjoy how there is a different coloration in places. And what's great is when you when you have, you know, a turn of the form in some way, and maybe, you know, this palm frond is all one kind of green tone. And then you do, uh, like I'm doing a brown tone here, something a little bit closer to yellow. And I do that same turn within the browns as well. So like you have a darker reddish green color kind of brown. And it also turns into a lighter brown to a darker brown. 
you reinforce that form tremendously uh, in the viewer's eyes so much because they see, oh, there's like all these different colors that are making the same change in value. It's very convincing. I wonder if anybody that's on the stream right now is facing any difficulties with their own artwork. If you are, please share, or if you're watching this in the future, add a comment below. Tell me what because I'll get the comment and I will respond. Tell me what you're just struggling with. I would, I would love to help you. And if you want to know more about my entire process, the process that I've used for this entire painting, you can look back at all the live streams. And if you, because right now we're up to, I don't know, 65, 66, something like that. Um, there's just a ton of information and content within all those live streams. And if you want all the resources, the digital resources for the previous live streams, uh, you can see the link in the description below to go to Gumroad and download all those. It's like 50 some days of digital downloads for only $1. I want to make it as crazy a value for you as possible. I also have tutorials on my gum road for how to paint the eyes in oil, how to paint noses, how to paint mouths in oil. And I'm working on right now a tutorial about how to paint ears in oil. All very similar processes. I'm extremely excited about the ears because that painting turned out really well. I was super happy with that painting. Did a great job on it. So yeah, check out the links in the description below for that. Super inexpensive so that you as artists in school, wherever you're at, can improve um, your skills, improve your knowledge without breaking the bank, <laughs> without having to spend a bunch of money. I remember going to school in Chicago, working two jobs, trying to have a life outside of jobs at school, always tired. <laughs> not really having enough money to do anything with it. So one thing that I know is going to happen within the subsequent layers, the glazing layers that are, that are going to come in um, with these palm fronds is as soon as I oil out in this area, I'm going to get a much better understanding of the values, the hues and saturation for this whole area 
and it's really going to help me to understand uh, what I need to change because right now dealing with half dry paint and half wet paint it's very difficult to to see if the palm frond that I'm working on is too intense if it's too light if it's too dark you know that kind of stuff um, but it's not going to be a huge problem and the reason why i say that is because we are using this time to establish you know layers that are as close to um, what we want as we can get and if i just take my time and if i think about this i can get close enough so it's going to be a perfect underlayer without a lot of fixes for the glazing layers. Okay, let's get some purpley magenta going. Make it a little bit lighter. Maybe not that light. And we're going to add some life into this palm front. So I'll repeat this again because I repeated it a lot of times, but you know, repetition is, is good. Space repetition is always good for learning. You can add life into any painting, any hue, so any different color on whatever you're doing, as long as the value is similar. So I'm adding a purple here and I'm putting it in certain places and it looks fine. I mean, it just blends right in. It adds a little bit of interest and life to this palm cron. But I'm adding it to the places where the value matches. It's, it's a pretty dark purple. So it works really well within these darker areas. Now, if I took the same purple and I added it into a very light area, it would not look right. Next thing I want to do is mix up a crazy teal because we got to have a little bit of teal in here. Oof, that is a crazy teal. Holy cow. Let's see where that value can go. Yeah, it's fairly bright, so it's going to go up here. And I'm not going to worry about uh, bringing the top palm frond over this palm frond yet. I'll wait till this dries and I'll do it then. So that would be part of, you know, one of the later layers. And I think that would be fine. I want to add a blue in here too. Kind of maybe a bluish gray, like a light blue gray kind of color. And just a couple strokes like the palm front is a little bit wet in places I mean it is jungle okay now I'm at a point, I'm going to step back, I'm going to grab my tea and step back and see where we're at. Yeah, yeah that's much better than uh, where it was before. 
much, much better. Okay, that's an hour, but we're not done just yet. I'm gonna do a couple things to prepare for the next stream because what we need to do, we can't see it right now because it's down here. It's down below where you can see is set up for painting the next palm frond. So I need to reach behind my canvas and undo it so I can lift it up as far as it'll go. And I'm gonna be hitting the mic as well. <laughs> I need to lift up the mic. I have a shotgun mic right up, right above. Like that's gonna take some other adjustments. still can't see the palm frond all the way so can we lift the canvas up even more all right that should show see not only the palm frond on the bottom right but also that little piece of frond that is on the uh, left side of the tiger as well should update as well it'll go to the top boom there you see <laughs> it went to the top okay now you guys are seeing everything the next stream we'll be working on the bottom palm frond and i think what i'm gonna do is this entire palm frond is going to be gray. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not relative color, but... Um, oh, geez. It just left my brain. Okay, I have to think, I have to get this. Oh, camera positioning is good. Thank you so much for, for uh, helping me out there. Here's another book that you guys, uh, everybody listening to this may like. This is a uh, traditional oil painting by, by Virgil Elliott. I really love this uh, book because he goes through, like it says on the cover, advanced techniques and concepts for the Renaissance to the present or from the Renaissance to the present. And he talks about how all these artists from the past you know, how oil painting began, um, all the way up, you know, uh, you know, Rembrandt's method of working, uh, all this really great information. And it's, it's a wealth of ideas for me to communicate a lot of cool things to you guys. And one thing that I want to work on for the next palm frond is, and I'm reading a bit here because there's a certain word I forgot that I want to figure out
Hmm. Harmony, I guess, is what I'm looking for. A unity and harmony within colors. Um, that's That's really wasn't the word that I was looking for as well. All right. Sorry, guys. Give me a second. relativity oh can't believe i mean I've, I've talked about relativity so many times before but it wasn't clicking with me that that's what i meant so when i'm i'm next uh stream tomorrow morning i'm going to be working on this palm frond and i'm going to be using color relativity to describe it what is that what is color relativity um you can have a gray look like a green. You can have uh, a gray look like an orange. And relativity usually happens in desaturated colors. You get a lot of relativity, a lot of subtleties. Uh, and you really understand how relative color can be when you're in these very desaturated tones. Uh, the reason why is it depends on what everything else is around it. And I'm going to work up this, this frond here because we have gray tones all around this whole thing. Uh, very desaturated. This is like a black, a gray. We got grays here. We got gray here. The only thing that's somewhat saturated is a little bit of this green in the background uh, has some saturation to it. And I am certain that I can make this look green with a gray tone. And the reason why I want to do that is because I want it to be desaturated. I want it to not pull away from the head of the tiger. I want it to be um, this subtle thing that tells you, you know, I'm a palm frond and this is what I look like. Um, but even when I look at the digital image, when you look at the digital image that we created, it looks very gray uh, because I believe it is. One of the tutorials that I have planned is it's all about getting started in oil painting with really cheap paints, but at the same time, uh, working through kind of a, a student procedure at beginning oil painting by starting uh, with very simple colors, which would be black, white, like a burnt sienna, sienna color and a yellow ochre. And with those four colors, that the super limited palette, you can you can make very harmonized, uh, like automatically harmonized paintings with blues, greens, purples, uh, all kinds of colors in there because of color relativity. Yeah, yeah, relative color. Um, it's a fantastic um thing to learn honestly it's it it's really i think where you can unlock the power of color is in the grays it's not i mean yeah i mean it's great to look at uh, monet and van gogh i mean i love these artists um but it's also I, I think even more impactful when you look at artists that use mostly grays and are able to really uh, master or have the power to describe through that limitation. You know, I, I think it's really, really amazing. So yeah, that's going to be pretty cool. We're going to play with it tomorrow with this palm frond and uh, yeah, my palette is already clean. I just have to wash these brushes out, put them in my brush soak, and then everything will be set up and ready for tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will see you at the same time tomorrow. <laughs>